The topic of this panel is the titled the Long-Term Management Strategy, LTMS, for dredging, a new day, a new way, perhaps. And the reason for that is the Bay has changed fundamentally since uh, the LTMS process began. Consequently, we think it's time that we consider whether or not a new way to conducting our dredging program is necessary. It's been over 20 years since Mudlock spurred the development of the LTMS in San Francisco Bay. Since then, we have seen a profound change in the dynamics of the San Francisco Bay, and an equally, if not more significant, change in the economy. So the first uh, premise that we're gonna touch on is, is the Bay changed? And what we're getting at there is there has been a fundamental change in the Bay. The sediment dynamics have shifted, leading to a general statement that the Bay is potentially sediment starved in some areas. For that subject, I'm gonna ask Dave Schulhammer to come up and brief us on his research and science, since he is actually the person who has uh, reached this conclusion. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Rick. For those of you who are uh, not familiar with the United States Geological Survey, we are an agency in the Department of Interior, and our mission is to provide unbiased science to decision makers such as yourself. The areas that we study include natural hazards, energy and minerals, um, and water resources and ecosystems. I'm specifically dealing with water resources, and my specific topic of research is sediment transport in San Francisco Bay. Uh, as part of that research, for a number of years, as part of the regional monitoring program for San Francisco Bay, we have been monitoring suspended sediment concentrations in San Francisco Bay. This is the quantity of suspended sediments, or mass per unit water volume, in the bay. This has been going on for a number of years, supported by the Corps of Engineers. And the time series of suspended sediment concentration is shown up on the screen. These are data collected every 15 minutes with optical sensors, and these particular data are from Point San Pablo at the uh, Port of Richmond, and they were collected from 1993 to 2006, about 13 years of data. If you look at these data, you can see a white vertical line, and if you apply the very scientific eyeball method, you can see that the data to the left of the line appears to be greater than the data to the right of the line, and in fact, your eyeball would be very correct Bay-wide, with all of our monitoring sites, there's been a 36% decrease in suspended sediment concentration that began in 1999 and has continued until this day. With the gold rush brought people to San Francisco and also brought a lot of sediment into San Francisco Bay due to hydraulic mining. With that sediment came in in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and since then the bay has been erosional. Now, in 1998, that was an El Nino year, if you may remember, and we had some record high flows through the river system that essentially washed a lot of sediment out of the bay. And so those contributed to the sudden change in the sediment regime beginning in 1999. Also, sediment trapping up in the watershed due to uh, deposition in reservoirs, deposition on floodplains, has also contributed to this change in the sediment dynamics in the bay. I'm frequently asked, well, is this change a good thing or a bad thing? Is this you know, the end of the world or what's going on here? And it certainly isn't the end of the world. It's, it's a very different thing. For instance, it's a good thing in that the bay is recovering from the effect of hydraulic mining during the gold rush over 130 years ago. Also, seagrasses in the bay are beginning to expand as there is more sunlight in the water column so the seagrasses can expand. For water quality standards for contaminants that are associated with suspended sediments, those water quality standards may be easier to obtain because there's less suspended sediment now in the water column. It is a bad thing if you are a tidal marsh um, trying to sustain yourself against sea level rise because that sediment deposits on the marsh to help sustain the marsh. It may also be a bad thing for water quality in terms of a process known as eutrophication. With more sunlight in the water column, we're seeing more chlorophyll. 
when that chlorophyll dies off, it can uh, basically suck the dissolved oxygen out of the water and cause uh, things such as fish kills, as is seen in Chesapeake Bay. And so this is now a new concern for water quality regulators. In addition, there's been a uh, decline in some fish species, mostly up in the delta, known as the pelagic organism decline. And some of those fish species we know like turbid water, and the water is now less turbid, and so conditions are less favorable for those fish. So I think the take-home message here is, as Rick said earlier, that the bay is a very different place now than it was 12 or 15 years ago. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dave. That's, that's really like the key premise of what we're diving into, is establishing the agreement and understanding that the Bay has profoundly changed. Um, the second premise is, do we need to test? In broader words, it's, it is questionable whether we still need to test the sediment for maintenance dredging. We've been testing for years and at a significant cost. Um, to that end, I'm going to ask uh, Bridget DeShields with Arcadis to describe her experience with testing bay sediments, 96% of which are suitable for placement in both marine and upland environments. Bridget. Well, I'm going to build a little bit on what Dr. Shellhammer just uh, discussed as far as the suspended sediments in the bay because really what is it that we dredge annually from berths and harbors and channels? Well, it's uh, bay sediments that are resuspended every year. About 20 times more uh, uh, sediments are resuspended in the bay than what we than what we dredge in the bay. Uh, so really, what we're dredging is this ambient material that's in the surface uh, sediments of the bay that gets resuspended and redistributed in these deeper areas. We know from uh, much of the sampling we've done in the bay through the regional monitoring program and other programs um, that. Uh, we, we understand the quality of sediments in the bay. We understand what the ambient levels are. And we know that uh, deeper sediments, actually from core studies, are more contaminated than the surface sediments in the bay. Those deeper sediments represent, as Dr. Shellhammer uh, mentioned, mining inputs, uh, also legacy in industrial inputs to the bay. Other sediments that are problematic are, are mainly in hot spots, not in our, not in our berths and uh, harbors and channels that are dredged more uh, frequently. We've been testing dredged uh, sediment in the bay for about three decades now. Uh, in that time, point sources have been uh, largely controlled, non-point sources have been managed, and our monitoring of the bay shows that it has gotten cleaner. Uh, and studies have shown that the majority, uh, as Rick mentioned, of uh, dredge materials are suitable for unconfined aquatic disposal. This has been known since uh, um, 1990 when the Corps of Engineers did a big study on uh, dredge sediment data comparing the uh, results of um, sampling done at that time that showed that very few uh, dredge sediments had any uh, potential to pose toxicity in the bay and we've seen similar results since through works, work by SFEI and others. Um, yet, the testing requirements have continued to become uh, more complicated, more stringent, uh, detection limits get lower. Uh, that's a lot of expense for material that continually uh, is tested in these same areas and continually shows uh, suitability for unconfined aquatic disposal. Some uh, areas do get tier one exemptions um, through the uh, testing framework, but probably not enough areas. Even for the regional monitoring program for San Francisco Bay, we've been debating the value of collecting sediment data every year. Uh, should we collect it every other year? Should we collect it every three years, every five years? We don't see a lot of change in the Bay. The other issue we see is that uh, dredge material continues to be looked at as, as a waste, when really it uh, should be looked at in a different way. It is a valuable resource. Um, keeping it in the Bay and in the system, if it's clean, should be a good option, and we need to take another look at how we're managing dredge material. I put up an example here, a uh, recent uh, uh, news article about Noyo Harbor, not in San Francisco Bay, but on our coast. And um, this is, I think, a good example of material that's been tested year after year after year and has shown to be clean. And they don't have a disposal site up there, so they take it uh, and they put it in an upland disposal site, and then they try to reuse it. 
on projects. It's become increasingly difficult for them to do this, and this is a headline we might see um, later this year. Noyo Harbor District spends tens of thousands in tax dollars trucking clean sand to a faraway landfill. Um, that would be a real shame. Uh, this material is, you know, as clean as what you might use for, you know, wetland restoration project or clean backfill on an upland project. And so, you know, it would be a real shame to see this kind of material not reused in a practical way in a local area in a sustainable way. So in closing, I just want to urge uh, the regulatory and dredging community to work together, find better ways to utilize resources in managing uh, dredge material, both uh, in terms of testing and also beneficial reuse. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bridget. Um, the third premise relates to increased cost, uh, substantial increase in dredging and placement costs. Uh, for that topic, uh, we have two speakers. First, Bill Dutra from the Dutra Group will explain the causes of these high costs. And then also Steve Hollister, city manager from the city of Leandro, San Leandro, will share his perspective relating to a marina that is being abandoned due to the high cost of dredging. So first Bill and then Steve. Well, thank you, Rick. Let's see, I think, oh, we got our slide up here. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, needless to say, it always comes down to why is, why is dredging so expensive? And, uh, you know, being involved uh, here in San Francisco Bay for over three generations and, and seeing a lot of changes and actually working with, uh, with uh, Frank Berger and, and, and the Bay planning, there has been a lot of changes and, and there's been a lot of demand put on the on the dredging, uh, dredging industry, but I'd like to touch, uh, touch on uh, work restrictions. As we know, as we became more environmentally sensitive and, and recognized that we were all gonna have to live together, swim together, and environmentally work together, uh, we, tried to, uh, we tried to partner, but we, we said that we were gonna establish work windows. These windows uh, have, a, have an impact uh, on on our cost of, of dredging, uh, frankly, uh, you know it takes a, a dredge fleet. Dredge fleets composed of, uh, of machinery, people, fuel, and these people have to and these individuals have to make a living year round. So they can't be sitting here waiting for a window to work. And so we have to move. And we have found that uh, our costs have have gone up because of the fact that. We have to work in a lot different, tight environment. We have to uh, uh, apply uh, di different processes. We, we have involved in siltation curtains, all different amenities that add to make everyone feel comfortable and secure. And I think there has been, in certain areas, uh, benefits to this. But I think also there has been a lack of, uh, lack of knowledge and understanding. And if we could truly partner in these areas, I think we could find that, uh, that these windows could be expanded in different areas and we could, we could work on a more cost-effective way of doing our dredging. Dredging depths, another area on what we call no advanced maintenance, a decrease in what we call the pay face. Uh, as you know, we've been uh, appropriated millions and millions of dollars to deepen our ports and harbors. And then, as we know, through the years, we are restricted by, by funding on how much money we can, uh, can spend. And we have rules and guidelines that uh, we can't do advanced maintenance in certain areas. And what, is it, what does that really mean? The dredging industry wants to put out the most lowest cost, the most economical way of keeping these ports competitive. Due to the raising cost of labor, raising cost of fuel, we've gone to larger buckets, we've gone to larger machinery, and yet we're asked to be able to, uh, to dig within tolerances that are, that are not acceptable. Some of our tolerances are not even as high as, as one of those glasses out there, and our buckets are as, as tall as this as room. So it's a matter of, of balance. I think that if we, could, if we could really readjust ourselves and start thinking out of the box a little bit, in reference to the advanced maintenance, 
I think we could be more cost effective in our in our maintenance and give our channels a, a better safe and, and, and shaping for our shipping industries. The other one I wanted to touch upon is uh, the uh, is our Corps of Engineer dredges. As you know, in the private industry, and this has always been confusing to the private industry, is we are only allowed to work within certain restricted areas. But our Corps of Engineer dredges are, uh, have a different set of, of rules and regulations, and, and that really puts an impact on us because the law really says private industry first and then Corps of Engineer dredges second. And it's hard for me to understand when we're trying to uh, keep our ports, Port Oakland, San Francisco, some of the uh, San Pablo Bay areas, that our dredges in the private industry side are not allowed to, uh, to do their job. And it's, it's a cost. These, uh, these assets uh, cost money if they're sitting, and, uh, and we need to get the utilization up on them so that we can put a lower cost out to our, our customer. And our customer is the public. Other areas that we have is the rising cost of labor. There's no question. I mean, we're already facing uh, labor costs, and, and why? I mean, we've seen a, a large increase uh, at the gas pump here in the last, uh, in the last few months. I mean, uh, these, uh, these uh, individuals that manage these dredges, these are, this, our, our work is a very dangerous working in the environment. It takes a high-quality, skilled group of individuals and uh, they have to be compensated a fair and economic wage. And they have costs, and so we have to provide a, a livelihood that develops that uh, personal uh, touch and, and that quality of uh, in, individual. I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty simple. It's, uh, it's, it's tough for a family to make it today. We're seeing rising costs in school costs, grocery costs, et cetera. So it's another area that, that we're dealing with and what we try to do is deal with it with our production, our capabilities, and some of the other items that I just had spoke on. Another area that we are challenged with is uh, upland displacement. Uh, I think it's excellent that uh, under the LTMS, you know, we've decided that, you know, first we were going out in the ocean, then we were going to go upland, and, and we have different arrays of, of dredging projects, from mega projects in the deepening of the ports to, uh, to a small marina operator or boating and recreational area that uh, has uh, its own maintenance and issues. And I, I think we really have to reassess that area because I think we've taken a broad brush and we really haven't thought out of the box and we said, okay, let's just go upland. And as we all know, there was a major upland project uh, that the Port of Oakland uh, participated with, uh, I think, over 5 million yards and pumped it 8 miles and, and built a beautiful sanctuary up in the ha Hamilton Field area. Well, what does a marina operator do? What does a, what does a, what does a small maintenance uh, uh, operator do? I think we have to think about where we can have these beneficial uses that are cost-effective. Um, it's not fair to say that, you know, in, in, in my tender over the three generations and, and watching this bay. Uh, I travel over some of these disposal sites that we're not allowed to use anymore. I think we have to reassess that, and I think we have to reassess the real benefit of some of these. Uh, many years ago, these disposal sites were not just used for dredge spoils. Well, they, you could dump docks, broken concrete, whatever. They started, uh, they started not acting like the way they are, but now I think that we have the technology that we can uh, rethink some of these uh, adjacent sites that will make us more competitive and actually more, uh, make us more uh, cost, uh, cost effective. Upland sites, I think uh, when, uh, when somebody tries to plan an upland site, I think we have to really look at the cost effectiveness and the overall all benefit uh, of it. Um, you know, these are big challenges and, uh, you know, we can sit here and, and we can point fingers and we can complain about agencies, and we can complain about uh, uh, delays and et cetera. But, you know, I personally think if we, as a group of individuals, can not look at our individual responsibilities, that, what we provide as a service, as being adversarial, but be truly partners, 
and really try to form a form that's, uh, that's, that's going to be really cost effective. Because as we heard from John Garamendi, and I've known him for many years, we have a challenge to, uh, to pay our debt off. We have a challenge to, uh, to get uh, freight moving in both ways. And, uh, and we know that the, the world is very competitive. We've seen the expansion of the Panama Canal. We see what the ports are investing in larger ships. We have a responsibility to the safety of our environment and in this wonderful bay. And I think that if we can start working and thinking out of the box and, and take the fear, uh, and fear really sometimes is a, is a lack of understanding, and if we can educate one another to, to the point that uh, we can be a more productive dredging society, a more productive upland, and again, I think in closing, the dredging business is a very capital-intense business. It takes a tremendous amount of capital to properly put a dredging fleet together today and meet all the requirements, the requirements that are important. They're not just requirements, they're, they're ethical requirements. Bottom dump barges that will, that will not leak, uh, environmentally contamination material that has to be treated. These are big investments. What happens is, is we, send, we tend to go along for a year or two, and then we decide to change. We decide if we're going to go to the ocean, we're going to decide if we're going to go upland, we're going to decide if we're going to dump in the bay. And those shifts, those short-term shifts, have serious financial impact to the cost to the owner because we have to then readjust our capital in, in reference to meeting the new demand. So I think, you know, when we talk about long-term strategy, I think it's critical. And I think that we really do need to, to uh, truly respect partnering and really respect trusting one another and not be adversarial. And I think adversarial comes from just the lack of knowledge and fear. And I, it, with that, if we could put that together, I think we can dig ourselves out of the hole that this country is in and make our shipping industry and our productivity high. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Bill. Uh, Steve, now? Thank you. Uh, the slide I have is a demonstration of what the San Leandro Marina is facing in terms of some decision points. It's been a number of years where we have not been able to afford uh, dredging, which is usually paid for by the federal government through the Corps of Engineers, and it's a constant uh, situation of going back to Washington, D.C., asking for funds. Usually we're about two to three years behind when we should dredge, when the, the dredging actually takes place. But more importantly, it's then the disposal of the dredged spoils which has really made it infeasible for the city to, to continue to have a full uh, marina in San Leandro. We have a uh, Uplands uh, dredge material management uh, site, which was at one time I, before I came on board to San Leandro, touted as a very, uh, touted as a very uh, cost effective way of dealing with spoils. However, what we've turned out is that the value of the spoils at least on a fill type of market, has not been there. So we've been paying in the last dredge to uh, remove the spoils, take them over to Oyster Bay, which is about a mile away, but uh, transporting is very expensive. So th the disposal costs anywhere from a million and a half to two and a half million dollars. We now have, we were able to get funded for a dredging uh, 18 months ago, and we have the spoils drying in the uh, uh, upland site to remove those and take them over to Oyster Bay, not paying the landfill costs such as you saw in the uh, Noyo Harbor uh, slide is going to estimate it to cost two to two and a half million dollars. Now we're working with people to, I'll call it conjunctive use. We put in for under the WARDA uh, legislation to have uh, inclusion of using our spoils to go to the Eden Landing uh, <coughs> wetlands re rehabilitation. Uh, we have uh, talked with the flood district about uh, using those spoils, but nothing's come to fruition. So 
instead of a 450 uh, berth marina, we'll have most likely an aquatic park which people can uh, use their uh, kayaks and, and canoes to paddle around. It'll be a very nice area. We hope to have some commercial development uh, done around that. But, and we'll have a boat launch which people will be able to use with shallow draft uh, craft, usually at high tides. So uh, my message, I think, is that this isn't a new problem for San Leandro or a number of marinas. About four plus years ago, we did a survey of similar sized marinas uh, in the Bay Area, and none of them were making money. All of them were losing money. It's always a struggle to have the monies to, to operate the uh, facilities. And San Leandro is in the unfortunate situation of having a two-mile federal channel. So we have quite a bit of uh, material to uh, dispose of. The, uh, we're not giving up completely. Uh, each council that I've uh, served with and looking back on the history has never wanted to be the, the city council in which the decision to close the uh, small craft harbor has been made. So the can is perpetually kicked down the road. We have a council and a citizens advisory committee and a private developer was working with us on a master plan for the marina shoreline area. And there are, hopefully will be some ways to have a, a aquatic park similar design but with some uh, craft still uh, berthed there on a perpetual basis and that will be self-sustaining. The uh, economy did not help either uh, with the decrease in revenues from other shoreline enterprises such as the Monarch Bay Golf Course and the uh, hotel and two restaurants we have there. But even before the uh, economic uh, downturn, the marina was always struggling. Loans for both uh, Department of Boating and Waterways as well as the general fund primarily to pay for uh, dredging. Unfortunately, if we do nothing, we're still going to go about $500,000 a year in the hole, even if we continue to rent about half our berths and we just let the uh, facility deteriorate and take uh, berths out of uh, operation as they deteriorate. It will still uh, run a deficit. So it's an unfortunate situation. I was talking to Jim Hauser, Hausner, who used to be our harbor master several years ago, and uh, he was saying that one concept is to look at uh, recreational marinas as an asset for the entire bay. Uh, you have Redwood City on the uh, peninsula, which is the furthest south. We're the furthest south on the East Bay. Granted, we're, we're not in a very navigable uh, area, but it is an asset. It's a regional asset, and it's not just an asset for San Leandro. So that will conclude my remarks, and I'll certainly be able to answer questions during your uh, question and answer period. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. That's a uh, very interesting case study for the Bay to look at, uh, particularly in a small marina market. Um, the fourth premise uh, relates to the significantly reduced federal funding approximately 30% cut, I think, for FY11, or is it 12? Well, over what was enacted in 10, I think, is 30%. Yeah. Um, so for that, uh, I'd like to have two of the panelists speak. Um, first is uh, Colonel DeCiro from the San Francisco District and talk about the Corps' budget and where we're headed. And, and you'll be speaking about the San Francisco District budget. The Corps nationwide has seen a dramatic cut. But then also I'd like to ask uh, Sam Shookett from the Coastal Conservancy to speak about his viewpoint of it because Sam, through the Coastal Conservancy and, and the Hamilton, Belmer, and Keys project, is a partner with the Corps. And I think sh uh, Sam can shed some light on what happens to from the partner perspective when your partner sees a significant funding reduction. So, um, Colonel? I appreciate Bill Dutra's comments. Um, a lot of the regulatory agencies, as new people come in, um, they are ignorant. 
they don't know why the rules were enacted. So one of my things I've been saying, if, if the rules don't make sense, or everybody's forgotten the premise of what they were based off of, ask the question. I mean, I am bringing that up. Well, L last LTMS meeting, we talked about advanced maintenance dredging, and all the committee members going, makes sense to us. Why not do it? And then, of course, the core looks at our budget numbers like this, we can't even get back to authorized depth, much less go deeper. So we are looking at the core saying, okay, where can we cut costs? We will be looking at, instead of annual dredging, seeing if we can get from the core of engineers to get maybe Oakland to do it for biannually. In other words, double the money, let a contractor go out there and get more economies of scale. Currently, I'm not even doing annual dredging dredging right now. Last year in Oakland, we did um, let a contract out in September last year with a small amount of what was left over for the budget. We knew it wouldn't get us much. Then we put in options to use the fiscal year, this fiscal year money. So what does a contractor have to do? He's got to bid based off the known, the base contract, because he doesn't know if it's a guarantee that the options will occur. So he's basing, I'm going to base the cost, expensive, off of the known base contract. Hey, it'll be all be gravy if we get the options, and then I'll get money. So I'm not even able to do dredging right now for a single year. I've got to take two years of money, put them together, and get efficiencies in contracting. What we would like to do is work with headquarters, USACE, and say, you know, let's pool two years of money together and put it to Oakland maybe in 10, 12, 14, and get it more economies of scale, if that kind of makes sense. Um, other things we're kind of working on to get money down where possible, uh, again, coming up from industry, whenever I sit down with industry, there's great ideas coming out. One was sand mining in Sassoon Bay. It's like, hey, the sand miners are a mile away in the, in the uh, shallow portions. One guy was like, I would love to put my sand miner in there in the federal channel and get rid of that problem. And so right now we're working with State Lands Commission. Maybe we can get a break on royalties and get them in there. But it's starting that process of ideas from the community. Uh, throwing this chart up, yeah, we've been told 10% cuts starting this year, next year, and on down the line. So what's the Corps doing? With their work plans, they're focusing on those uh, projects with the most tonnage. So the strategic ports, Oakland and Richmond. So with the budget that we get, if it's president's budget, based off last year, one, uh, one, one years of money can get me about 57% of what shoals up. So every year something shoals up, we can get about 57% out. And then with the downturn in the budget, and also with Hamilton shutting off, and having to go to deep ocean disposal for 2012 in Oakland Harbor, I could probably get about 29% of the sedimentation out. So overlapping what was left over from 11 and what's not taken out in 12, that gives me about 17% of what shoaled up out. And 2013, another 29%, and about 5% of the, all the sedimentation is out. So that kind of tells you where the slides are on that. Um, Richmond, same way. You can kind of see the 10% budget starting to take off, uh, going from 50% annually to 47% annually to 40%. And then Sassoon uh, also starts building up. I think some of the uh, industry will talk about some of the ways to get from Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund. It isn't for the core to advocate to do that or not. We just, again, execute what Congress gives us the money to and execute. So you will never hear us advocating one way or the other. Um, what was the last part? I'll think of it at the, that's all I have. I'll think of it when question and answers. Thanks. Thank you all for being here. I, I'm Sam Shuckett. I'm the executive officer of the State Coastal Conservancy. And speaking of budgets, uh, Trav, you'll be happy to know that the governor has just released an executive order 
banning all non-essential travel, including attendance at conferences, so this is my last public appearance of the year. Um, maybe, who knows. So let me give you my basic perspective uh, on uh, sediment management and the LTMS, and then uh, I'll talk a little specifically about the uh, project which has me joined at the hip uh, with the colonel. Uh, fundamentally, we think at the Coastal Conservancy, and I think that in the era of sea level rise, throwing away sediment is stupid. The seas are clearly rising. They have been rising. They will continue to rise. There's very little evidence that I see that the global community is going to start restricting carbon emissions anytime soon. You may disagree with that, but show me the, show me the evidence to the contrary. And even if we stopped putting carbon into the air, uh, we're looking at a planet that will continue to warm for centuries and seas that will continue to rise for perhaps as much of a, as a thousand years. So dredging our harbors and then dump, dumping all this good, clean dirt into the ocean is silly, in my mind. Uh, unfortunately, moving it around within the bay has proved to be much more expensive than was originally uh, expected. When Hamilton was in the planning phases, and this is before my time at the Coastal Conservancy, we were told, among other things, that it would cost two to three dollars per uh, metric yard, per cubic yard, uh, to move the dirt to the Hamilton site. The actual cost has been more like ten or twenty dollars per cubic yard. So that's a very significant uh, difference, obviously. It's an order of magnitude. <clears throat> and uh, honestly, if we had known that, we probably would not have gone into the project to begin with, and we certainly wouldn't have accepted ownership of Hamilton Field, which did occur on my watch. Uh, because some of the cost estimates for this project, particularly for the completion of Belmer and Keys, have been so high that there is no scenario, no, no funding scenario under which we could complete the project. Even if the Army Corps of Engineers was flush, and even if I was rolling in money the way I was, let's say, five years ago, um, there's no way we're going to do a $600 million restoration project and only restore 2,400 acres. Um, we, we can't do that. And, of course, he's not flush. Um, and, I, you know, I've still got a few bucks, but uh, there's no money for the Bay Area in the water bond proposed for 2012 right now. Uh, and, of course, the water bond may or may not pass. And if it doesn't pass, then next opportunity is 2014. And by 2014, uh, I will be... Uh, out of money, out of funding, and not just for the Bay Area, but, you know, but, but, but for the whole state. Now, this is a big motivating factor for us to be looking at the alternative transfer facility, which, um, while not cheap, uh, would uh, make moving sediment to Hamilton and Belmar and Keys significantly less expensive. It deals with one of the problems that Bill mentioned, which is sort of the uh, having your equipment and people on standby, uh, it would sort of alleviate that. People could uh, drop the material off, and then we could pump it when we wanted to and, and were ready. Unfortunately, uh, this proposal is giving some of our regulatory friends uh, heartburn, and uh, we need to figure out a way to work through that with them. Uh, if we don't, I don't really see a way forward for, uh, for, for the Hamilton, Belmar, and Keys project. We're just not going to have the money. Um, I'm now in the full, uh, full measure of middle age here, so I've been around long enough to have seen a few recessions and to have seen some swings of the political pendulum, and I know that uh, nothing lasts forever and no party stays in power in Washington forever. Uh, probably not in Sacramento either, although that may be a different, a different matter. So I, I don't think we're going to, we're not going to be broke forever, and the economy's not going to be in the tanks forever. Uh, but there's not going to be a lot of federal money around in the foreseeable future. 
uh, and the state's funding outlook is highly uncertain. Many of you know that I'm involved in an effort to generate some local funding for wetland restoration here in the Bay Area, but even if we're able to pull that off, it's not going to generate uh, enough money to do these multi-hundred million dollar projects. So uh, as everybody up here has talked about, we need to figure out how to make these things cheaper. One of the ways we figured out how to do that, we think, is the alternative transfer facility, but we're going to have to work our way through the regulatory process on that. So I'm delighted to be here, and uh, I look forward to uh, taking your questions. Okay, thank you, Colonel DeCiro and Sam. Um, so the fifth premise relates to uh, regulatory aspects, endangered species. Um, because in any well-balanced conference, right, Will, we have to have the regulatory perspective of this. And in that regard, we have several representatives. Um, so what I'd like to do, I'm going to have several people come up. Uh, Dick Butler with Noah Fisheries, Colonel DeCiro representing the core regulatory aspect, Bruce Wolf from the Regional Water Quality Control Board, Alexis Strauss from EPA, and Steve Goldbeck. So we'll go in that order, please. Uh, Dick Butler, Colonel. Thank you, Rick. And thank you all for hanging in there for the whole afternoon. I looked at the agenda and I see that uh, we're the only thing between you and the cocktail reception. <laughs> so I'll keep this short and brief. My name is Dick Butler, and I'm the uh, Area Office Supervisor at the uh, North Central Coast Office of National Marine Fisheries Service. That's Protected Resource Division. And we uh, are concerned primarily with endangered species issues in the bay and along the coast and in the anatomous waters inland, uh, primarily salmon, steelhead, and more recently, green sturgeon, which is causing some issues. My introduction to uh, LTMS was kind of, we weren't really heavily involved. Our participation was spotty over the years. Uh, we weren't in, among the original uh, agencies to be involved until uh, I think it was in the early 1990s when Sacramento River Run, uh, Sacramento River Winter Run, uh, Chinook salmon were listed, and that became a big issue. Uh, with the Port of Oakland deepening and, and other issues. Shortly after that, we listed Coho, uh, then uh, Central Coast Chinook, and Steelhead, and the southern uh, distinct population of green sturgeon. So earlier, Ellen Jonk was recognized for bringing people together. And like I said, our participation in LTMS was spotty. And one day I came to my office in Santa Rosa, or I was visited in my office by Ellen and Steve Goldbeck, who convinced me that I, I needed to participate in LTMS. And to sweeten that pot, they would make me the chairman of the long-term solutions work group. And so I volunteered to do that. I've been doing that for a couple, three years. Uh, I'm not even sure it's, uh, how long that's been. But LTMS to me is about bringing people together, about solving these problems, about collaborating, about forming partnerships. And in my experience, when you know people and you sit down with them at this table and you explain what your interests are and you listen to what their interests are, breakthroughs happen on a regular basis. You learn the projects better. You learn as Mr. Dutra was saying, and I, one of my own biologists said to me uh, this week, he said, we can't consult on pile driving unless you've seen pile driving. You can't consult on dredging unless you've seen dredging. And that is, is very true. So we're, we're getting educated. We have, I have 25 biologists working for me that are very experienced in these matters and also very collaborative and uh, when we can be flexible, we are. 
the LTMS results in, in efficiencies that way. I heard earlier comments about uh, the competitive, competitiveness of your business and the need to get projects done on a, on a time frame. Well, I think LTMS contributes to that. And National Marine Fisheries Service, we support LTMS. We're challenged by workload, and now we're going to be even further challenged by that uh, with uh, downsizing of government, perhaps, and certainly reduced budget. LTMS helps to make efficiencies, though, and makes that situation better. It was mentioned, uh, Sam Shuckett mentioned the uh, ATF. Uh, I happen to be, it was our, my agency that was, had some heartburn with that. And through LTMS, we got to know each other, and I met Colonel DeCero at the uh, Warm Springs Dam a few weeks ago, and he brought it up. Uh, would you be willing to sit down and talk about the ATF uh, Aquatic Transfer Facility project again? Well, of course we will, We're, and we will do that. I think uh, I've responded to a doodle poll, poll already, and uh, that meeting is going to be, be set up. And I'm sure Tom will be there from Sam's office. Uh, one of the things I was asked to maybe come out up with is a, an idea about LTMS and how we could uh, leverage our uh, our efforts. And an idea I have, one observation I make about LTMS is it does have stakeholder participation. Participation. There, there is opportunities for stakeholders to be involved and for regulatory agencies like myself to hear them and to understand their situation. Uh, I think we could increase that, though. I think perhaps uh, a whole separate committee could be developed to just put stakeholders together with uh, the agencies. It's my observation that uh, in meetings, the stakeholders are the ones that are really engaged. They're the ones that are the most pragmatic with their solutions and their, their problem uh, solution oriented. And so with that, I would thank you for just hanging out. Since Colonel DeSeer has already spoken twice about uh, <coughs> regulatory, he's going to pass, and we're going to have Bruce Wolf come up and speak. So maybe I'll say what you were going to say, huh? Or have said to a certain degree. Uh, greetings. I'm Bruce Wolf with the uh, San Francisco Bay Regional Water Board, and our mission is to preserve, protect, enhance, and restore the bay. Now, what's key about that is there's nothing in there about uh, enforcing laws or writing regulations or such. And to me, those are the tools we use to carry out our mission. But they are just that, they're tools, which brings us to LTMS. LTMS we view as a tool to protect, preserve the Bay in a very efficient manner. It has been very efficient. In fact, Bay Planning Coalition was instrumental about 10 years ago getting the Dredge Material Management Office connected with LTMS, the Hammer Award for nationwide efficiency. So uh, we've come a long way. For our agency, LTMS is key to something very significant to us, which is uh, restoring impaired water bodies. And because we have LTMS in place, we're able to say that the dredging community does not need to uh, achieve certain reduction in loads that inherently the process is built in by just continuing to implement LTMS that there will be reductions in mercury, there will be reductions in PCBs, and so further work is not necessary there. But we do recognize that conditions change. As we've heard, uh, the sediment dynamics in the Bay are definitely changing. The finances are changing, and so uh, how do we update and improve our tools so that we can continue to achieve our mission. And this is where I need your help. I, while I'm an engineer, I'm not a dredging expert, but I do need a tool to deal with dredging. Certainly to a degree, we feel that the current tool has worked well, we're comfortable with that. So if I'm gonna use a different tool, I need some help sort of connecting the dots of how we are still able to achieve our mission and ideally be efficient at the same time. We have a recent example where our agency issued the Sonoma County Water Agency 
a multi-year permit for its stream maintenance program. Sorry that um, Grant Davis, who was here earlier, left to uh, get a nod out because we worked well with the agency to come up with a uh, improved tool in our mind, an improved uh, approach that strategic maintenance and uh, less frequent uh, sediment removal saves money and reduces water quality impacts. And so it's a win-win. And that definitely works better than the old tools of a project-by-project -project permitting scheme. Can we replicate that? I think we can. I think you've been hearing about uh, the benefits of the stakeholder process. Uh, like everyone else, our agency's funding is uh, dropping. We're back to 92, 93 levels. Um, and I'm down to only uh, one and a quarter positions to deal with dredging and LTMS. And even though that's grant funded, I'm trying to protect it against uh, somebody up in Sacramento saying, you don't need that. We do need it. But as I say, we recognize that if, if we're updating our tools to be more efficient to save the community money to achieve our missions, that's helping us because we don't have, have any other way. It strikes back to Travis's comment earlier on America's Cup. We have to make this work or we have to make this work. So with that, I'll hand it off to my fellow uh, management committee. Good afternoon, I'm Alexis Strauss. I work for you, I work for the Environmental Protection Agency low the past 32 years. And of those 32 years, the past 20 have been spent in some measure on dredging in San Francisco Bay issues. It's been fascinating. I still feel like I'm at the beginning of a learning curve, but have had wonderful partners with the Corps of Engineers, with BCDC, the regional board, and with the resource agencies, both NOAA, NIMFS, and US Fish and Wildlife Service, and a number of, of specific applicants who I think have really enriched our understanding of what we can do here in the Bay Area to make this work. It's interesting for me because I also am responsible for um, similar uh, EPA roles in LA Long Beach and in Honolulu and in very small harbors in the outer Pacific in the US territories. So for me, this has been, and in particular with my colleagues on the East Coast, a, a long 20-year investment in how we can do this well. And I still firmly believe that we have set out what we achieved to do as we began almost 20 years ago, and that we have every opportunity now to be more innovative in addressing some of the cost and logistical issues that you've heard about throughout the day. What did LTMS set out to do? Um, in part, we set out to reduce in-bay in disposal because that was a task of convenience and we were getting rid of a waste and that was a very efficient and cheap way to do it at the time. So we set out to reduce in-bay disposal and we set out to promote beneficial reuse of those sediments. Um, in so doing, we also set out to make the permitting process much more efficient by bringing together the four key agencies, CORE, EPA, Regional Board, and BCDC. That commitment and partnership continues to this day. As Dick noted, it also brings in the resource agencies. But that has been unusual for me in seeing the commitment of my colleagues and principals for those agencies getting together on a regular basis, getting together in a public forum um, every month or every other month to work through very specific permitting challenges. And I think that commitment on our part um, is something that carries forward for all of us. The Bay Planning Coalition has been very important in bringing not only key issues forward and advocating for its membership, but has also played a key role in being able to advocate for research funding. Um, both with Jim Hausner and CMank, Ellen has been tireless in saying what are the research priorities that support dredging and port and maritime operations in the Bay Area. I will go look for that money and I think Ellen, part of the tribute that you have earned is that you've been so successful in being that advocate and I wanted to thank you and wish you well always, even if you never have to advocate for another federal dollar ever, um, a lot of very important science um, and partnership has come to understand the Bay because of that research effort. I don't know how much of that we will continue to afford in the next five to seven year cycle, but let's just look at it as the next five to seven year cycle. We'll use the money we have, the 
for ideally the highest priority, and we'll be very sharply focused um, should money become available again on what additional research is out there with federal, state, and local partners with SFEI here in the Bay to take advantage of that. I do think that we can continue to operate um, even under um, more dire financial conditions with the same kind of success, but two things stand out for us. One is clearly apparent is the CORE's budget for both projects and maintenance dredging very much affects our ability to beneficially reuse projects as an aspect of the larger dredging project. I'm very concerned about what that means for us in the Bay Area. It may be that we don't have any more large restoration projects for the next few years. It may mean that it's going to be very difficult because of the cost of materials handling, the cost of the contracts themselves, and just simply doing the basic dredging that is the purpose of the project. It may be very difficult to support beneficial reuse of sediment around the Bay. Um, in medium and small geographic needs. We've all learned how sensitive to distance um, and rehandling these projects are. We can't just imagine a project that, let's say, comes from uh, the Pinole Point or refineries area. That can't suddenly be moved to Oakland or Crown Point or the South Bay. We really have to think about what are the geographic alignments in the South Bay, in the Central Bay, and in the North Bay that might ideally become cheaper or more efficient if we take a longer planning horizon, if we think about who might be doing maintenance dredging two to three years from now, how much historically have they dredged in volume, how much might be needed by other potential users around the Bay in that general area, are there things that if we give ourselves not this year, this project, and where can this stuff go, which is our current modus operandi, but if we really try to think about users of dredged material that we haven't yet brought to the table. I think that is part of what our challenge will be, is to make that happen. To that end, we've had a number of invigorated and really interesting workshops with key players. Some folks who I've heard of over the years um, who do kind of medium and smaller size jobs, who have different kinds of equipment, different ideas. I wanted to particularly acknowledge Jim McGrath and Jim Hausner for being the energy behind some of the participants and ideas that have come forward in those public workshops that we would like to continue. Because I think in expanding our ongoing discussions, more ideas will come to the fore, more potential solutions are out there. They may not be solutions for this fiscal year, the, just the few months that remain, or the next fiscal year's worth of, of, of dredging projects, but we may be able to lay the groundwork for cost-effective, smaller-scale projects, pilot projects, things that we haven't done before um, a couple of years from now. And I'm completely up with our folks at EPA and our partners for trying to make that happen. In recognition of the time and our interest in hearing your questions, um, I will pause now. And um, thank you very much for having me and for inviting me. Thank you, Alexis. Um, I've asked uh, to keep this thing on schedule. I've asked Steve Goldbeck to hold his comments till following the sixth premise. Um, the sixth premise is where we, we can really bring all this discussion together into developing some shared visions and tools. Uh, this process kind of started last year, I don't remember when, but uh, we had a dredging workshop in June of last year where we really kind of kicked off this discussion. And then uh, late well, January and February, we had, uh, I think under Alexis's leadership, uh, some LTMS management committee meetings where all these stakeholders got together. And, you know, frankly, in my opinion, the discussions were uh, astounding, the, the type of discussion we were having. These were discussions that would never have happened 15 years ago. And so I'm very uh, charged and excited about where we're headed and, and really the openness of the agencies to listen to these alternative ideas. Sure, there's all kinds of challenges and issues associated with them, but it starts with discussion and getting things on the table. Um, so towards that end, um, the sixth premise deals with this, you know, developing a shared vision of tools that we can all work together to develop and employ in order to enable us to maintain navigation in an environmentally responsible and cost-effective manner. For that, I'd like to ask, uh, Len Cardoza, 
and then Steve Goldbeck to come up and share their perspectives on tools we can use to move the process forward. Um, Len, I think you know you can summarize a lot of what we've talked about at the LTMS meetings. And then Steve, you can give us that you know viewpoint of view. What does it take to enact these things? What are the issues? Um, and then following that, we'll open it up to the, all the panelists to share any other perspectives they may have, and then we'll broaden out into the audience for questions. Thanks, Rick. Um, ah, there it is. Now, you know I always like to be helpful to my old organization, uh, San Francisco District, the Corps of Engineers, and perhaps you didn't understand what Colonel DeCiro was talking about earlier about the state of the uh, decking and that pier at Humboldt. So I ran up there and got a picture of it. <laughs> um, but actually, I want to want to have a, a preface to my my remarks by once again bringing up a story about Ellen Jonk. About 10 years ago, when I was losing a lot of sleep on how to deliver, and Harry, thank you, on how to deliver the Port of Oakland's 50-foot project, Ellen Jonk came to me, always helpful, and said, Len, think inside the box. <laughs> and what she was doing, and successfully did, is that was reminding me of the cargo that comes inside those boxes, inside the container terminals. And by looking at that, we we're able to significantly expand that diverse stakeholders, folks who have an interest in the cargo moving across the Port of Oakland, and quickly took that project from on nobody's list all the way to a project of national significance. Uh, so, I'm taking the same concept, the same premise, thinking inside the box, but instead of box, think inside the bay. And more specifically, think inside the Bay Delta region in terms of dredge material. I've taken a lot of material, some of it personally, <laughs> 55 miles out west of the Golden Gate to the deep ocean disposal site. And I hate that idea. It just makes no sense because this material has been and should continue to be successfully used as a resource rather than a waste. And you've already heard a lot of the wonderful forms that exist right now that we can do this. The LTMS properly expanded into the Delta LTMS, both programs significantly underfunded, by the way, the dredge material management plan that comes from that, the dredge material manage op management office that you've already heard about, which is a collaborative um, form of federal and state agencies all at the same place at the same time to solve problems. Uh, in addition, you have some outliers called, such as the regional monitoring program wonderful organizations that you've heard about, including the, the core, USGS, it goes on and on and on, a BCDC, Regional Water Quality Control Board, all in a collaborative mode. Where else could this happen? All looking at perhaps adaptive management and, as Rick said, new ideas. And here they come. I've got one kind of new idea that we've been talking about and two older ideas. The first one is using dredge material as in-bay nourishment as a way to perhaps attenuate for climate change and sea level rise. Use dredge material to restore the eroding boundaries of the bay, um, specifically tidal wetlands, areas that actually function as giant sponges. And what's really neat about that is some um, I think what some really, really smart people in the, here in the audience demonstrate, perhaps through a pilot program, that if you start, if you start a, a, an area um, reversing the eroding area um, with dredged material, it will then capture some, some of the um, remaining suspended sediments in the bay and continue to grow with sea level rise. Um, and there's other ways, again, some really smart folks, perhaps you'd want to rainbow that material in, it's kind of spraying it in so it comes in as a very, very 
shallow area with perhaps minimal or, or no impacts on the environment, nearshore placement, or perhaps offshore placement as recently demonstrated outside the Golden Gate to nourish um, Ocean Beach. That's the first idea. Second one, um, restore elevations in former bay lands. Again, no, this has been done before, Sonoma Bay Lands, Hamilton Project that Sam spoke about, some potential new projects. But let's look at different ways of doing it. Um, and then finally, I'm going to conclude with another old idea, but one in my mind I don't think we've used enough, and that's to use dredge material um, at landfills for daily fill and cover. You've heard about the Noyo experience, but we've had, we, which was not successful, and also the, uh, an experience out in San, um, Santa Cruz, which was not successful in terms of being cost effective. However, Recently, we took dredge material from um, California Maritime Academy uh, to Dixon Landfill, and it was very uh, successful. And it, uh, the material was used as an almost impermeable layer to cover the garbage on a daily basis. So let's take lessons learned from the successful operations. So far, I believe to date, only, only uh, at least in the Bay Area, only what I call chemically challenged or unsavory dredged material has gone to landfills. But perhaps it is cost effective to use, say, uh, to use a clean dredged material, including sand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I am batting cleanup today, so I truly am the last person between you and drinks. And uh, it's been a fascinating day. Um, I really like this. I really like the cool 3D picture on the cover. Problem is, I couldn't find my 3D glasses. Did you? Did, nobody else got them? Okay, I feel better. It wasn't, it wasn't a slight. Uh, I'm Steve Goldbeck. I'm actually the chief deputy director at BCDC. Uh, and um, from my perspective, the LTMS has been uh, very successful. Uh, anybody who remembers the good old days of Mudlock uh, will know that We've gotten major, helped major dredging projects like the Port of Oakland 50-foot project to be accomplished. And dredging has become routine. We don't have the challenges uh, from the environmental community. Dredging goes on. But on the other hand, the world has fundamentally changed. And I have to say I agree at least with uh, the former speakers in the aspect that taking material that could be beneficially reused out to the sea, to the deep ocean site, no longer really seems to make sense to us. But on the other hand, going back to dumping it, for example, at Alcatraz, I don't know if that makes sense either. The majority of the material disposed of at Alcatraz goes right out to the ocean. And in an environment where we have less suspended sediments in the bay, and we have sea level rise that's going to challenge the ability of wetlands or remaining wetlands to be able to persist as the sea levels rise. We're going to need to use that material very judiciously. And Dr. Calloway, uh, a wetland scientist, has said the most important thing in wetland restoration projects in the Bay is when you restore these subsided sites is to very rapidly get them up to that intertidal elevation where you start to get organic plants growing because then you have not, not only the sediments coming in, but you also have the growth of the plant matter to help these wetlands persist. So it seems to me that the information that Dr. Shellhammer has given us tells us that we need to actually redouble our work to beneficially reuse dredge material to help us in our regional approach to managing an expanding bay. And I think that uh, we do need to learn from the past efforts, the things that worked and the things that didn't work. We have some really strong economic challenges now. But uh, really, as other speakers have said, this is a, a national issue. It isn't just an LTMS issue or a beneficial reuse issue. Uh, we all have to support the ramp le legislation and other approaches to get uh, new funding to bear on this. And I think 
partnering with the environmental community doing large-scale restoration and small-scale restoration is a good way to try to work those collaborations. And the LTMS program is, has limitations because it's an actual program that has been acted into state and federal policy, so it can't change on a dime. But the good news is that the LTMS program has a lot of flexibility that was built right into it. Uh, we look at whether we're meeting our targets in three-year averages as opposed to any given year. So there is the understanding that if we hit hard economic times, we may not be able to track the program. But also, when we have these fundamental changes like we're seeing now, we also have three-year and six-year reviews in the LTMS to say, is the program working? What isn't working? How do we change it? And I think this is where we can start to bring some of these ideas that we've been talking about and start looking at how we put them into the program. And the last pitch I will make is that I think a, a big part of that strategy ought to be the concept of regional sediment management. And this is the idea where instead of looking at your navigational dredging project or this flood control project, we look at the bay system as an entire system and how sediment processes work in San Francisco Bay. So we'll need to give more dollars to our uh, USGS friends to do some key research. But we also look at how we're managing the system and how we can manage it better. And some of those ways we can manage it better may be able to address some of the issues we're talking about. It may make sense to be feeding mudflats. In fact, we have a grant at BCDC from the US EPA uh, to look at wetlands up in Corte Madera and look at pilot projects for ways to feed wetlands to help them persist. And we need to look at that. Though there, you have to think about how we're going to do something that works. Like Mr. Dutro was talking about, to be efficient, most of your dredging projects, you need to dredge, you want to dredge 600,000 cubic yards. You want to dredge a lot of material at one time. Placing that on a mud flat is going to have some real challenges in addressing uh, environmental quality issues and addressing endangered species habitat issues. So we're going to need to look at where should the big projects be reused, maybe at an aquatic transfer facility to Belmer and Keys. Maybe what we want to do is looking at small projects, small marina projects, and feeding wetlands. So these are the kind of things we need to be looking forward in a regional sediment management context. And that is actually how the LTMS is proposing to proceed. So I think that we have a way forward to start vetting out some of these concepts and seeing what's the most appropriate mix as we go forward and try to understand how we live around an expanding bay and keep our channels clear while also maintaining environmental quality. And with that, I'll close. Thank you, Steve. With that, uh, I'd open it to any of the other panelists if they have any other specific comments they'd like to make. And then we can go to questions. Is there any questions in the audience? Yes, ma'am. Thanks to each one of you for all the work that you do to um, promote the environment and the economy of our bay. I was just wondering about the intersections between long-term management strategy for dredging and the impacts of invasive species and invasive species management. So if you could address that, that would be great. Thank you. Who cares to take that one on? Is this on? OK. In fact, there's some thinking in my office that perhaps that's, there's an opportunity to seed newly exposed Bay subtitle areas that have been dredged with native species. This is really in its infancy. It needs to be fleshed out. There's a lot of work. It's, it's just an idea at this point. But to me, it's an interesting idea. So. Um, I think that's a really cool idea. <laughs> Having been involved in 
several successful invasive species eradication, I've come to the conclusion that it's unlikely that we're going to be able to uh, deal with invasions much in the future once they occur. I don't think we're going to have the capacity, at least as government agencies, to do that, and the name of the game is going to be stopping the invasions from happening in the, in the first place. And once they're in, um, it's very hard and very expensive, and even though we've been successful in a few cases, I'm kind of not optimistic about the future of getting rid of the things that are already here. Uh, this is a cost question for Bill Dutra. Your dredging cost factors are also present in other parts of the country. Why does it cost more here? Well, well I think what we have here is, as I said earlier, in, in other parts of the country, and I would say Great Lakes and, and Mansa could speak even more about this, but you, they have more, uh, in other parts of the country, we have more consistent disposal sites where uh, the capital expenditure can be made and, and an asset can be put online and, uh, and the dredging asset continually uh, handles that disposal site or that area for 20 years. When you, when you look at it here, uh, we've, had, we've had many changes. Uh, we uh, decided to go to the ocean now we don't want to go to the ocean. We decide that we want to go upland, and instead of going upland maybe adjacent to our channels, we want to go eight miles upland. So these, uh, these bring the, the variation and really cause a major cost impact. The environmental windows that we put upon us where uh, dredges have to leave the area and then come back put uh, great mobilization issues to it. You've got other parts of the of the country where they have a consistent dredging program, consistent disposal site, and a, and a consistent asset with people and equipment. Yeah, I think the great example of that is, uh, is, is Chesapeake Bay with Har Miller Island where they, you know, 20, 30 years ago adopted an all upland uh, disposal practice, virtually all upland and built a facility, but made a commitment and a consistent commitment to go there for the next 30 plus years. Um, yes, sir, you had a question? Yeah, hi, I'm Michael Drennan. I'm the California Regional Manager for Weston Solutions, and I too am totally inspired by the, the number of decision makers that we have in the room and up on the stage, and it occurred to me at a decision makers conference, we might want to um, maybe, as leaders, we all like to you know, not just talk about what the issues are, but maybe even like make a commitment to action. And it just, I was also just thinking, given that this is the 24th conference, maybe we could have everyone up on the stage commit to by the 25th conference have a progress report on the six kind of uh, premises or metrics that you set, which I thought were great. And it'd be, you know, kind of, I think it's always powerful to just make a commitment that. You know, we're, we're people of action here. We're all leaders, and let's commit that we are going to make progress on those, uh, at least those six premises, you know, by uh, the 25th conference in honor of Ellen. <laughs> Thank you. In honor of Ellen. Boy, well, Gary, I said uh, Any response to that? Collaboration with commitment. <laughs> um, the next question is two questions directed at Len Cardoza. That I'll give you your list back here in a second because you made your notes. How do you propose to get dredge material to the shallow margins of the bay. Great idea, but how do you get the material there? And then two, any plans in the bay region for a rehandling facility? Is Berth 10 going to reduce prices or become free? Right now, for approximately $100 a yard to use Berth 10 in landfill, not cost effective. Thanks, Rick. And um, for one, my plan A, since the, the Starship Enterprise was no longer using its transporter room, I thought that uh, I would use that and then take the, use it to get the dredge material, but that's probably not going to work. So what I think will work is actually taking the concept that we successfully, um, the joint venture, Manson-Dutra, successfully built and used to get dredge material 
to Hamilton and perhaps downsizing it. Some other very clever dredging companies are also working on the basic concept. Perhaps a smaller pipeline built on flexi floats that would be able to sit on the mud flats at low tide. Um, and then using a series of booster pumps to get the dredged material over the, um, across the shallow margins of the bay where it's needed. Another thing we're looking at is actually areas where the natural channel gets close to the shorelines, that happens in some places in the north and south bays, is actually stockpile the materials for use later uh, by a conveyor system or, again, uh, uh, a slurry and a hydraulic placement system. Um, these, obviously, these ideas are in their very infancy, but I think they can be developed and cost effectively. Second question was about the birth tent rehandling facility. Again, working with Ellen, we looked at doing a regional rehandling facility. The single problem and challenge we were faced with is um, shoreline piers or, um, or docks, piers, or marginal wharfs with deep, relatively deep water access uh, is at a premium around the bay. And it's probably not the highest and best use uh, for those areas. It's probably not rehandling, because as you rehandle, you, take, you can take the facility out of commission for some time. Um, so, again, lessons learned. What we've forgotten is, in, in addition to the pier or the birth tent rehandling facility at the Port of Oakland, several places have built temporary rehandling facilities. Port of Redwood City, there's Mike sitting there, and uh, was successfully done, and also was done at the Port of San Francisco, uh, successfully using K rail on docks. So there are some areas you can do, uh, some, and some places, we just have to look at it a little bit harder. So that right now, the birth tin enjoys, uh, birth tin rehandling facility enjoys a monopoly. Is it the only place that you can go to? So thank you. OK, well, to wrap up, uh, keep us on schedule and get everyone to the bar as soon as possible. Um, I'll just summarize it, I think, uh, in the last eight or ten months, it's, it's really been an astounding period of discussion that's taken place. I think, as Mike says, that's great. We've all talked about some things. Now let's try and coalesce together and come up with concrete changes and solutions and answers that uh, move this forward and, and, and recognize the cost limitations we're facing. And uh, I look to everybody in this panel here to continue the dialogue. I think, you know, I think Alexis, you're the one who was spearheading it, or at least it appeared that way. And for that, I really, you know, can't thank you enough to, to bring everyone together and allow us to talk and find new ways to go. So with that, I'd like to thank all the panel members uh, for all their contribution and thank you all for staying and, and uh, participating in this.